Hello, everybody, and a warm welcome to this symposium introducing Navitor, a new Tavi solution. My name is Helge Mollmann, and um, I'm happy to share this session. The session is all about the new Navitor device, and the session objectives are given here. We would like to discuss how to minimize resources needed for your Tavi procedure without compromising safety and efficacy. We'd like to show you how to, uh, or to demonstrate how to simplify the TAVI procedure and to discuss considerations for lifetime management of your patients with aortic stenosis. Um, this session um, has a couple of very renowned speakers. So the first speaker will be Professor Manu Haran, and he will talk about um, new solutions for reducing the PVL. Session second speaker will be Professor Sondergaard, and um, he will show us a um, Navitor case, a life in a box case. And the third speaker will be Professor Smith, and he will report about patient outcomes with a novel valve. After that, we have the opportunity to discuss um, all the features that have been um, presented during the talks, and we are happy to answer any given questions. With that, we are good to start, and um, I would like to welcome Professor Manaharan for his first talk. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you for the introduction, and uh, welcome to the session again. Uh, I'm going to uh, show you a solution to mitigate power leak using the Abbott Navitor Next Engine device. These are my uh, conflict interests. So, the Navitor uh, Tavi system is a next generation self-expanding design to mitigate power valve leak by having a very unique outer cuff. Let's go straight to the area of interest, first of all. As you're aware, this is a self-expanding night based technology, but importantly, uh, it has been designed with a unique uh, outer PBR feature uh, with a cuff, and each of these little cuffs are almost like an inverted parachute that will actively fill during diastole, uh, once in position at the annular point, to improve sealing and significantly reduce PVL. We'll come to that in more detail later on. Other features of this device, again, uh, as you can see, that it uh, has a very large stent design to improve coronary access. It also has a curved uh, outflow portion here to improve stability and to reduce any uh, interaction to the aorta. And again, it also has an inner cuff material to further enhance sealing with the uh, leaflets of the native annulus. But um, importantly, it still maintains structural integrity by having a bovine uh, leaflet, which has been shown over years to have the best uh, long-term outcome. The device is designed to be implanted in patients with annulus ranging from 19 uh, millimeters to 27 millimeters. It comes uniquely in four different sizes, 23, 25, 27, and 29. Therefore, you will never need to be in a position where you're significantly oversizing at the annular point. In more detail then, now you're looking at this uh, from the uh, LVOT position. And what you can see in more detail is these cuffs, where there are gaps, fills with uh, blood blood products during diastole, and the anatomy then molds to the uh, structure of the patient. Uh, once these cuffs are filled, it recruits tissue in group for permanent seal. And again, you can see from the sagittal view again, similarly, where there are gaps, these cuffs then fill up with blood and blood products, completing the seal and optimizing uh, parvavu leak and outcome. The device is designed to be implanted approximately three millimeters depth uh, to optimize the unique sealing feature of this technology. Now, of course, when you have uh, patients, they come in various sizes and anatomies. This technology has been tested in the bench setting at various anatomical uh, configuration, both elliptical and circular. And you can see very nicely here, despite varying circularities and ellipticity, the cuff works very well, again, looking at this from the LVOT uh, into the uh, uh, valve.
Now, when you have uh, a unique uh, delivery uh, valve, you do need something uh, unique again to deliver it to your patient. And the flex and delivery system has been designed for ease of use, low profile, sheetless access, flexibility and deliverability, stable for deployment, predictable and accurate valve placement. And again, this technology, of course, comes to recapturability, reproducibility, and retrievability. How does that do that? Let's look at the capsule and uh, itself. Uh, it has an integrated sheet, which is hydrophilic coated, uh, and therefore allowing you to advance this technology into excess of 5 to 5.5 millimeter diameter, transfamily or subclavian. The hydrophilic coating, uh, honestly, it's unbelievable when you advance it, you will not feel any resistance at all. It's like uh, taking a hot knife through a butter. It then has a very stable uh, layer called the stability layer that maintains the position of the valve. Uh, once at the annulus, you will not notice significant changes in positioning as you're deploying the valve. And finally, it has an ergonomic handle, which allows for ease of release and recapture. It also has a very nice safety button to ensure that you don't over-release and go to a point of no return without having uh, absolute confirmation that that's what you want to do. And as I mentioned before, it has a very low profile for deliverability. Uh, and for the 23 valve, it's 14 French equivalent. And for the remaining four other valve sizes, it's 15 French equivalent. So let's look at the capsule in more detail. It has a very low atraumatic flexible nose cone, and I think this also helps advancement from the femoral artery to the aorta, and certainly uh, in my hands, in, my, in our unit, this device really goes anywhere you want it to go. It has an integrated sheet I've already mentioned, which is 14 French equivalent, as you can see here, and what I've noticed is that the, from the capsule to the integrated sheet is absolutely seamless. You don't feel any jumps or snags, especially when you're advancing it through the femoral artery for the first time. The large frame uh, cell design gives you a far lower uh, metal mass, and that allows this capsule to be flexible. And what you'll notice is in advancing, especially through very tight arches, a natural bend occurs around the two-third position that uh, enables you to then advance to very small and very tight uh, curves. And I think the other really great old-time uh, technology, but being used here is the hydrophilic coating that really allows this technology to go where you uh, want it to go safely without any resistance. So to summarize then, I think the Navator and Flagstaff Harvey system uh, has a novel design concept uh, that provides an effective solution to mitigate PVL. The Navator valve demonstrates low single digit mean gradient and large EOAs at the day follow up in clinical trials. And Dave will uh, take you into more detail and in depth about the clinical trial data based on this technology. The flex delivery system with its low profile, flexible catheter, hydrophilic coating and stability layer and, and ensures safe and predictable delivery of the Navitor valve. The flex delivery system is designed to be recapturable, repositionable and retrievable. And finally then, now that I've shown you what the valve can do, we will now then spend the next few minutes uh, going into more detail uh, and discuss further on how these design features impact on things that we see in our unit, which is fast access, deliverability, part of our leak, need for permanent pacemaker post implant, coronary access, which will be an important feature going forward to modern low risk patients. The potential for lethal thrombosis is an important area that has been investigated in very detail. And finally, valve durability, especially again when you're going down to a modern low risk patient. Thank you again for listening, and let's carry on to the next session. So welcome to Copenhagen for this live case on the new Navitor valve. My name is Lars Sandergaard. I'm here with my colleague, uh, Gintas Spilauskas, Ole de Bager, our fellow from Hong Kong, Ivan Wong, and our scrub nurse, Sophie. So before we start, Ole, maybe you can give an introduction on the case we're going to um, yep. treat today. Okay, so let's uh, get the first slide up. So indeed, uh, the case we have planned for today is a uh, TAVI with uh, the Navitor transcatheter heart valve, which is the newest generation uh, about uh, transcatheter aortic bioprosthesis. So next slide. 
So the patient we have selected is an uh, 83-year-old male with uh, slight overweight. Um, in the medical history, otherwise, he's known with arterial hypertension, also persistent atrial fibrillation, uh, slight bradycardia also, and uh, chronic kidney disease. And now, uh, the last uh, since a month, uh, since a year, actually, he's presenting uh, with severe aortic valve stenosis, uh, NIA class 3 dyspnea. Next slide. His ejection fraction uh, the, on the latest echo was actually described as 50%. However, a few months ago it was uh, even described as 40%. Uh, but then they started some uh, some heart, uh, medical heart failure therapy, uh, including also low-dose beta blocker, ACE inhibitor. Uh, and that got the ejection fraction up to 50%. Otherwise, he has a peak and a mean uh, gradient over the aortic valve of 96 and 62 millimeters mercury and an area of 0 0.6 square centimeters, so clear severe aortic stenosis. On the invasive coronary angiogram, he has borderline mid-LAD and PDA stenosis, but they were both FFR negative. On the ECG, as uh, said, he's in a per permanent atrial fibrillation, and he has uh, already a, a quite wide uh, QRS uh, left bundle branch block uh, with 174 milliseconds. In the labs, a normal uh, hemoglobin mild to moderate reduced uh, glomerular filtration rate or uh, renal function. So all together he has a calculated mortality uh, surgical risk score of 3.5%. Uh, Next slide. So if we look then to the CT, so first starting with the annulus, he has an annulus perimeter of uh, nearly 81 millimeters, so a perimeter derived mean diameter of 25.7 millimeter. You see a, s a slight calcification also at this annulus level. And then uh, at the upper LVOT, uh, two millimeters below the annulus, he has nearly the same uh, size. Uh, so there's no not much tapering of this uh, LVOT. Next slide. The coronary heights, so the right coronary artery is uh, around 20 millimeters, the left main is around 16 millimeter height. Next slide. Sinus of Falsalva, the smallest diameter is there, 31, the maximum diameter there is around 34 millimeters. And then uh, the cal uh, he has clear uh, calcifications, moderate to severe leaflet calcifications on all three uh, leaflets. Next slide. Aortic root angulation, 55 degrees. ST junction is around 26, 26.5 millimeter, and also slight calcification uh, there at ST junction level. Next slide. Normal configuration of the aortic arch, and we also show you here the cerebral vessels, the neck vessels, uh, as we have the intention to use uh, the Sentinel cerebral embolic protection device. Next slide. Then the excess, well, the excess is not completely uncomplicated, I would say. It is, uh, there is a mild tortuosity, but especially there are some borderline uh, dimensions. It's not that much calcified, but there is quite a lot of uh, soft plaque. And uh, the minimum diameter, we assessed the right uh, femoral excess or iliofemoral uh, sites to be the best one. But the minimum diameter is going there up to 5.1 uh, millimeters. So next slide. So what is the plan uh, as discussed up front? Well, uh, to do the case, of course, in local anesthesia, to use the Manta vascular closure device. Also, a 14 French introducer uh, sheet will be used. Also, Sentinel cerebral and polyp protection device uh, will be attempted to be placed. And then, pre dilatation with a 21 millimeter device. And as shown, the C on the analyst, uh, this should be compatible with a Navitor valve 29 millimeter. So, this is the valve we're going to implant again self expanding technology. Very large cells, which make it easier, as I said before, to access the coronary arteries. You see there's this outer active ceiling skirt. And also the ceiling skirt is going all the way down. It's not curved up anymore. And again, this uh, is, of course, to, to mitigate uh, the degree of pyrovalvular leak. Radial force, as I said, has been optimized across all valve sizes. And you see that the outer portion has been curved more than it, it was before. Here from the contralateral side, we, um, we actually introduced a pigtail to sit in the bottom of the non coronary cusp. This is, of course, going to be our guiding for where the aortic analysis is. And now um, we, we have the, as I said before, we have the AL1 catheter in place, so we, we're going to see whether we can use that to cross, cross this valve. You saw this. Oh, that was actually pretty easy. No, oh, that was... Uh... Yeah. yeah. <laughs> So this is done here in an LAO projection, and I'll just introduce it into the LV cavity, and then we're going to, as a routine here, to exchange um, 
it for pigtail. So you see here the hemodynamics show that we have a, a gradient of 53 millimeter mercury, but also very important that we got a diastolic pressure in the aorta of 39 and an end diastolic pressure in the LV of 6. Ben. So we're going to recall these two numbers, 39 and 6, uh, as part of our assessment mm -hmm. of, of PVL after the procedure. Mm -hmm. Yes, you're, you're introducing a safari. Is this a small or an extra small what you're it, using? It's a small one. Oh, a small one, okay. So it's a, it's a stiff, pre-shaped wire from Boston Scientific. This is actually our preferred guide wire for during the thyroid procedures. We, as a routine, again, use uh, this uh, true balloon. It's, it's a non-compliant balloon from BART. Uh, it's ex extremely fast to inflate and deflate. Uh, so, and it, it will take up to the nominal diameter, uh, so you cannot really overinflate it. Mm -hmm. we, we choose our balloon size here for pre-dilatation according to the minor axis at the aortic angle. So, so all we show that we had a minor axis here for around 21, 22 millimeters. So not to, to be too aggressive, we just use it to 21. So I'm now across um, the, the valve, and you see for, for the pacing, we have one crocodile lead here attached to the short guide wire in the left femoral vein. The other crocodile is here, is attached to the stiff guide wire. And of course, for this to work, you need to have some isolation on the guide wire. There needs to be a balloon, a delivery system, or a standard catheter. Otherwise, you cannot use it. So um, I'm going to ask Tanya here to pace a 180 max output. And when you're ready, Tanya, okay. Start pacing, pressure is down, balloon up, balloon down, stop pacing. Yeah. So, so we're coming out here. So now we have, you have to assess the rhythm indeed um, before removing yeah. this complete yeah. balloon. But patient seems to still have yeah. his, it's the same his rhythm. Um, atrial fibrillation in a with bradycardia. If you yep. see a third degree AV block, you should not remove it. You have to put an RV paste lead in before you do that. Mm -hmm. um, so now I think we're ready with the system. Yep. Yep. So um, if, you, if you can zoom in on the, on the system here, you see first of all with the, with the Navitor, with the FlexSnap system here, you have this modified, very flexible, atraumatic tip of it. You have the capsule where the, the valve is of course loaded. Then you have the shaft, and you have the integrated sheet here. So it's for this system, it's an outer diameter of, so it's hydrophilic coated all the way up here. So it's, it's very, very easy to introduce it. And also there is, as I can show you here, there's a stability layer starting here too, which is going to mitigate the, how much is actually going to dive into the LV. So again, you have a more um, precise and predictable implantation. So we introduce a, in the uh, integrated sheet all the up all the way up to the capsule i'm going to remove here if you help me again says um, um uh, the eight, 14 frame sheet so i'll push compressor in the, in the grind while we do that keep an eye on the guide wire mm -hmm. and again you saw this patient had very small arteries it were only about 5.1 millimeter uh, on the right side even smaller on the left side So coming up here, push the inline sheet all the way up. And what I'm also often asking is even if you can do some rotation on the handle, so to try to facilitate it's going in and you see it's going very smooth. I, of course, make the hydrophilic coating wet during this and push it forward here. So that went very smooth. And then we can attach the hemodynamics here to, to this once again. And um, we can just go around the aortic arch here. So I come forward and you see it's often very flexible. It will even make a small kink on, on the, on the stem, stem to take that. You see, it's, mm -hmm. so it, it will take very tortuous anatomy. Going into the descending, the ascending aorta here. So Lars, can you comment on how are you going to implant uh, this valve in which uh, angulation of you? Yeah, I mean, there's been, a, there's been this move uh, using uh, the cusp overlap technique. 
So that means that you actually, from your C, uh, CT scan uh, up front, uh, make a... Um, yeah, you can do that. From, from the CT scan up front, you try to identify the C-arm projection where the right and the left coronary cusp is overlapping. It's going to bring the C-arm from a classical three-cusp co-planar view, which is often in a LAO projection, towards an REO caudal projection. And um, the reason this is an advantage, or maybe an advantage, is that for these patients, if you use that, you're going, first of all, still to have the three aortic cusps aligned, uh, of course, with the right and left overlapping, but also taking the parallax out of the delivery system. So you have a better understanding how deep or high, how high you are with your, with your uh, valve implant. And, and finally, it's also going to elongate the left ventricular alpha tract. So you're not seeing it on a, in an oblique angulation as you would if you're using a, a classical LAO projection. So again, um, we hope this is going to give a more predictable high implantation. And you see, let's try to identify this um, uh, cosball lab view. Can you pull the screen a little bit down for me, Tanya? So it uh, was in Quartal this case, yeah. yeah, only quarter 30, 37, like this. And we can... There's still a little bit, but okay, parallax in your yeah. valve. Will you take this out or not? No, or maybe it compensates yeah. actually. Yeah. yeah, you see, you cross it one. the valve and so you can zoom one out. Yeah. So let's start doing one injection here. We just give 10 cc at a rate of 20 cc per second. It's ready now, even. So this is just to confirm that the pigtail is active in the bottom. You see, it's about one or two millimeter above the bottom. But but let's just keep that and uh, and, and and know that. So I'll go a little bit deeper with the, with the valve here, like this. And um, I'm going to do counterclockwise rotation. You see that's this marker uh, on the delivery system. This is probably where we want to be at the end, at the endless. Do you expect to base Lars on this or not? What's I your... think uh, we, because he's bradycardic, I would spe he got very large uh, stroke volume. So I would try to keep that stroke volume down. But otherwise, you do not necessarily need to pace with this uh, valve because you have the interannular leaflet position. So it's not going to give you this obstruction of, of cardiac output during it. So we can pace maybe 120. You can start now, Tanya. See, I'll keep that marker just at the bottom of the... Inject is enabled, if you wish. Yeah. And again, I don't want to go extremely high here because it's such a calcified organ, so we may need to go for post-dilatation, so I don't want to sit very, very high. So we'll aim for about 3 millimeter below the organ, 3, 4 millimeter. And you also see it's coming out a little bit constrained here. So um, just going up here to, we can come off pacing slowly, go down to 100, go down to 80, go down to 60, and then stop. So what I, I, we've seen is constrained here due to this calcium um, uh, calcified. What we can do here is that we can recapture and redeploy. It often makes the tricks, a trick uh, where to do it. So... Pace, pace, pace yeah. back up, pace, back up, pace. See, I'll try, I had to push a little bit forward at the same time because as you recapture, it's often going the opposite way. It's going to, to go towards yeah. the LVC. Yeah, now, now you see it's actually came out here. Let's have better expansion now, so I'll go once again here. It looks better now. So next thing here will be to go to an LAO projection, take the parallax out of the system, 15, 15. and to make sure that um, we actually are below that's nice. The left coronary cusp here, um, not to miss that. So we can do an injection here. So you can go so down to pace. So I'll push here. Yeah. 
So now Lars is going to deploy the valve. Um, pull the wire back. Wire is back. I can't pull fully back. Yeah. Because it's fully deployed now. Yeah. All right. Okay, now the valve is completely deployed. You see the three taps uh, who are detached from the delivery system. So that's always important to look at. And then also the nose cone is nicely in the stand frame right now. Then it's of course always clever to keep the wire in the ventricle. And now it's a moment to recapture the nose cone. So now what Gintas, you can zoom in on the handle maybe. What he's doing is he's uh, pulling back the nose cone uh, into the delivery system. Okay. Yeah. And then we come out and, now and we reintroduce um, yes. the, the fortune French sheet. Oh, so now we're going to introduce the pigtail into the LV again, I guess. Yeah. That's uh, the approach. So... We've got the second pressure line. So the, I think this looks encouraging for what we see here. We can... Re, mm. we can there is indeed a very nice separation in diastolic yeah. here. So, that's, yeah. uh, so let's go back where the pigtail is. Pig bring that into the output portion of the stent frame here for... Yeah, yeah I think that's good. Yeah, good position here. So we bring that out and we a little bit forward under contrast. And I will go back to this cusper lab view, which is just caudal 37. Caudal 37. Yeah. Like yeah, this, fine. we can do one Mac, and we give a bit more contrast and so We did. Go. It's ready. So as I said, I see absolutely no mm -hmm. valve leak despite this challenging anatomy. Yeah. Uh, I think here in this again, remember we are working in a cusper lab view, so we will. The frame will look to be deeper than if you did the yeah. injection in the classical LAO projection. But as I said, we are on a non coronary side, around 3-4 millimeter below the aortic valve, and then maybe a little bit deeper on the left side. But I think this is, this is really nice. Mm -hmm. so. So, so let's, um, let's now remove um, the catheters from the LV. So indeed, I mean, uh, looking at the anatomy and the amount of calcification, the severity of the of the aortic stenosis and uh, the, the leaflets, uh, you see that it's a very nice end result and it, it did not uh, need any post dilatation here. And also with this no par valve leak, this is what we have seen consistent with the cases we have done with this Navitar valve. It's really make a big difference. Uh, we haven't seen anyone having more than a mild PVL. Uh, I can add in the meantime, actually the ECG of the patient is completely unchanged. So um, the patient, as, you, as I told you before, was an uh, atrial fibrillation at uh, a rate of, yeah, here actually in the room, before starting even any puncture of the case was around 36 per minute, beats per minute, QRS of 170. He has a completely unchanged uh, QRS width of 100, uh, actually now 168 milliseconds, and he's still uh, atrial fibrillation, of course, at that uh, base line rate of around 40. So it's a complete unchanged uh, telemetry on an ECG. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, so we are ready. On the vessel looks, we do it on a DSA. To me, it looks as a tiny using here. I think we can get away with this of a little bit more compression. Yeah. So I think we're going to to conclude uh, the case here. Uh, I, I hope it's it demonstrated the the features of this new Navitar valve, and you saw despite this challenging anatomy, we we cut up quite a lot of calcification in the aortic annulus. This outer ceiling skirt is actually really a big improvement. As I said before, we have done around 15 cases with the Navitar valve here. We haven't seen any patient having more than a mild parvalvular leak. Um, so. Hope you enjoy the rest of uh, Euro PCR 2021. Thank you, everyone. Hello, my name is Professor Dave Smith, and I'm going to talk to you about the 30-day outcomes from the Portico Next Generation Vowel Study. These are my conflicts of interest relative to this presentation. So. The next generation or Navitor valve is the next generation of the Portico transcatheter heart valve. And amongst a number of design iterations and improvements, the main iteration is a addition of an active outer fabric cuff to reduce the risk of paravalve leakage.
So for the purposes of this study, as you can see with the sizing matrix below, we studied three, uh, four sizes of valve from 23 to 29 millimeters. The study design itself was that patients were recruited who had severe symptomatic aortic stenosis and who were considered to be at high or extreme surgical risk. Patients were enrolled in 19 sites throughout Europe, Australia and the United States. Follow-up was conducted at discharge, 30 days, and patients will be followed annually for five years. In terms of the design of the study regarding endpoints, the two primary endpoints are all cause mortality at 30 days, moderate or greater paravalve leakage at 30 days. And in addition to these, there are a number of secondary descriptive endpoints, including VARC2 clinical end, uh, events at 30 days and valve hemodynamics and paravalve leakage at both discharge and 30 days. And finally, there's changes in MYHA classification and six minute walk distance from baseline to 30 days. In terms of the baseline demographics of the patients, you can see that these people were relatively elderly with a mean age of 83.5 years. Majority of them were female. Their valve gradients confirm the finding of severe aortic stenosis. And in terms of comorbidities, at least uh, eight out of every 10 patients had at least one frailty factor, with over a quarter of patients having had atrial fibrillation, diabetes, or kidney disease. In terms of procedural outcomes, you can see that during the procedure, there were no deaths or conversion to surgery. Three patients required an additional navital valve, either due to malposition of the first valve or movement of the valve upon post dilatation, giving a procedural success rate of 97.5%. Every patient had a valve implanted. In terms of the 30 day outcomes, again, there are no deaths at 30 days. And as you'll see from the table below, there were low rates of VARP2 defined endpoints at 30 days. Now, I draw your attention to the fact there's one stroke, one major vascular complication, and 15% of patients required a new pacemaker. And of those 16 patients who required a new pacemaker, 13 of them already had pre-existing conduction abnormalities. When we look at the hemodynamics and paravalve leak rates, you can see excellent low-digit mean gradients across the valve, both at discharge and at 30 days, and high effective orifice areas at these same time points. In terms of paravalve leakage, 80% of patients had none or trace paravalve leak at 30 days, with one in five patients having mild PVL. There were no severe or moderate paravalve leakages. In terms of functional status and clinical improvement, 97% uh, of patients were either in MYHA class 1 or class 2 at 30 days, and 85% of all patients improved by at least one MYHA class from baseline to 30 days. In terms of six-minute walk distance, there was an average increase of 21 metres between baseline and 30 days. So in conclusion, this study demonstrates that there are low rates of VARC2 defined clinical events that show that the Navitor valve offers a safe option for patients with severe symptomatic aortic stenosis who are at extreme or high risk for surgical intervention. The large effect of this area and the low mean gradients indicate very favourable hemodynamics. And the absence of any moderate or greater paravalve leak and the low rate of mild paravalve leak suggests that an active sealing cuff is an effective design to mitigate against PVL. Thank you for your attention. So ladies and gentlemen, now that we just saw this uh, perfect uh, life in a box case, we are ready to start a discussion on some important issues. And um, so we would like to focus on the hemodynamics. We would like to focus on paravalvular leak, and we would like to focus on coronary access. Let's start with the hemodynamics. Um, Dave, um, do you have, uh, you have some slides, have some insights? Perhaps you should start with the slides, and then we could, uh, can discuss this topic. Okay, thank you, uh, Helga. 
Okay, so I'm going to talk to you about the hemodynamics. We've already seen presented in the symposium the 30-day results from the Navator study. And what you can see on the left-hand side of this slide is the impressive reduction to single-digit mean gradients and high-effective orifice areas. And as you're going to hear also in this following discussion about paravalval leak, and the headline figures are that no patients had more than mild paravalval leak and one in five patients had mild and everyone else had no or trace PVL. How does this compare to comparable observational data from other TAVI valve types? Well, you can see the Navator results on the left side, mean gradient of 7.4 at 30 days, effective orifice area of two centimetres squared. And this is a very favourable comparison with the supraannular Evolute Pro system and very uh, favourable indeed compared to the balloon expandable Sapien 3 system and the uh, self-expanding accurate NEO system, uh, the data presented there. This is a very busy slide, but it's also got some very important points that we need to discuss. This is from the randomised Portico IDE trial, and it shows on the left the comparison in a randomised group between the Portico intraannular first generation valve and the Evolute R and Pro system. And you can see that after two years of follow-up, we've got absolutely identical mean gradients and high effective orifice areas out to two years. On the right hand side of the slide, if you look at the comparison with the balloon expandable Sapien system, you can see we've got higher uh, effective orifice areas and also lower mean gradients. So a very effective uh, TAVI valve system with an intraannular location of the leaflets. And if we look at the future for both patient outcome as well as durability of the valve in terms of the spectre of potential patient prosthesis mismatch, you can see that the portico valve compares very favourably with the Evolute Pro system, but it's certainly more favourable than the balloon expandable Sapien system. And you can see in red there the low incidence of severe patient prosthesis mismatch that we really fear in the portico system. Um, in comparison to both Evolute Pro and Sapien. So I'll open this up for discussion now, if I may. Dave, thank you very much for sharing um, these important um, results. And especially the very favorable gradients are somehow astonishing for a valve that is uh, designed as an intraannular valve. Last, uh, perhaps you can share some insights, some ideas, how it comes that these um, really nice gradients are possible. Yeah, this is really an eye opening for both me and I think for, for many of us. We always uh, thought that self-expanding technology with a super and a leaflet position was giving, going to give you the optimal hemodynamics. But we have seen here in a randomized trial that it's also applicable to patients who are treated with a self-expanding technology with an internal leaflet position. I think what we need to see in the, in the future is also data only on patients with small aortic annually, whether it's also going to apply to that. But if that's the case, I think this is a perfect valve to, to, to gain optimal hemodynamic and probably also long durability. Ganesh, in your experience, uh, are there any uh, procedural factors uh, that uh, contribute to um, these favorable um, hemodynamic data? I think um, the Navator is a resheatable technology, so it was actually the uh, technology that first came up with resheatability and repositionability. I think people who deploy this valve uh, naturally will tend to deploy it in optimal position, which is about three millimeter depth. And that actually then functionally allows the leaflet to be about four millimeters above the annulus. And I suspect that that concept then transfers to the excellent uh, hem dynamics that you see. Uh, and again, just to go with last, I, you know, we did our first man now nearly 10 years ago now, and the first 50 series, uh, as you remember, Helga, were all actually very small anatomies uh, because they were, they were only 23 valve. And even in those uh, exclusively 50 patient 23 valve, the hemodynamics were similar to what we're seeing now in this uh, randomized trial data. So I think it is what it is. It, it does deliver good hemodynamics regardless of our size. And now we should perhaps switch a little bit gears, come from the hemodynamics and go to the 
PBL because PBL really plays an important role in the outcome after tower procedures. And um, yeah, I would like to uh, ask Ganesh to share some insights um, what has changed with a Navitor device um, to reduce uh, the PBL rate. Thank you, Helga. So I've already shown you what the Navitor technology uh, is all about. Uh, it has this very unique uh, sealing mechanism. Just a bit of history. If you look at historical data, we know that if you have moderate to severe PVR, the outcomes for the patient is poor, regardless of the technologies you use. So we need to find technologies and techniques that improve uh, this outcome. And Dave has very nicely showed earlier on that with the Navitro technology, you really get very astounding uh, outcomes, both acutely and at 30 days. Nearly 80% of patients had none or trace PVL, uh, and only about 20% had mild. Now, remembering that the technology uh, of forming a seal is designed to get better with time. So this is only after 30 days. So I think what we would like to look at is what this result looked like in about six months and a year from now, because once the ingrowth of the tissue forms and forms better seal around the uh, annulus, I suspect we'll find better results than this already, which is coming closer to a surgical-like outcome. So how does that compare then to the currently available next generation devices? And this slide shows the Navitor in one panel and then Pro, Accurate Neo, and CP3. And you can see that, of course, these are not competitive trials. They're different trials at different time points. But the ballpark figure, 80% nano trace, appears to be uh, as, at least as good as, but perhaps better in percentage points compared to the other technologies. And certainly even mild, 20% uh, is lower than the other technologies. But importantly, there are no more or severe parallel leak similar to the Avalib Pro as well. Now, this, I found this trial quite uh, interesting because the previous data were all from core lab echocardiographic uh, analysis, but in real world, we do it in the cath lab, right? We use angiogram, we do hemodynamics. And in the real world experience, uh, in about nearly 2,300 patients using fluoroscopic uh, guided assessment, uh, you can see that the, apart from the Lotus, nearly 78%, most of the other technologies uh, reached about 50 to 55 percent of none or trace. So I think it's important that the results we've seen so far are really encouraging. But what we'll need to see is how this plays in the hands of the general uh, public once people start using this in a wider uh, platform. I'll stop now and maybe open for discussion. Perfect. Thank you very much, um, Ganesh, um, for um, these data on, on the PBL um, rate. Um, Dave, let's start uh, with one point. Um, patients are getting younger and younger, and we, we are going to treat um, low-risk patients even more than um, intermediate and high-risk patients. Um, which role does an active um, system to reduce the PBL plays in your practice? Uh, absolutely is a good point, isn't it? We're all about to face treating younger and lower risk patients. And so to make our uh, TAVI result as surgical like as we can is absolutely vital, in my opinion. We've known for a while with the studies, long term studies of the outcome of the effects of paravalve leak on outcome that we need to wherever to avoid it in the first place. We need to abolish uh, anything more than mild PVL. And we've seen now with the Navitor results that we're capable of doing this. And as Ganesh has shown, those results really are amongst the best that we've seen with all of the valve types for reducing everything down to either no or trace or at the very worst mild PVL. Last purpose, you can um, explain a little bit how this uh, sealing mechanism works with a Navitor device. So obviously it, it works very well, by, but why is it so well? Yeah, the only thing we can say that, um, first of all, PVL rate has seems to come down with all platforms, uh, but also seems to be different so, uh, from valve to valve, how effective these sealing skirts are. And I think one of the benefit from this valve could potentially be that this signal skirt is actually only working in diastity where it's going to open up like as a parachute to to stop for PVL and it seems to be very effective as we've seen in those one first 120 patients treated with the Navitor valve. 
Ganesh, this uh, PVL mechanism, um, there's additional material. Um, does this translate to a larger bore sheath size, or is it um, without any differences to, to the old system? It, uh, in terms of your sheathless approach, it, it gives you the same OD uh, as the previous system, actually. So the engineering involved in it is quite remarkable. Good. Let's come to, to the next and um, not, um, nonetheless a really important topic, namely the coronary access. And now we are um, going a little bit apart from the implantation process itself and coming more to um, a time a period which is sometimes years later after implantation of the valve. Coronary access plays really an important role. Um, Again, with younger patients, perhaps even more. Lars, um, you have some slides for us um, to discuss this um, topic. Yes, hell yeah. As uh, we discussed, moving to patients with longer life expectancy, access to the coronary arteries is going to be very important. And we recently saw this re-access trial, 300 patients, and in 7.7% of the patient, it was not possible to access one or even two of the coronary arteries after valve implantation. Most frequently, it was patients treated with an Evolute platform, but it was also seen for other platforms. And I think one of the main reasons is that the valve is not aligned with the native uh, commissures. So we have, when the valve is implanted, it's going to have a random rotation inside the organs. So we need to try to orientate it correctly. We have what we should call commissure alignment and not a leaflet post in front of the coronary arteries, which is going to make it difficult or even impossible to access the coronary arteries. There's been a move from a traditional tricusp co-planner view, it's an LAO cranial projection often, towards an REO cordial projection, what we call a cusp overlap technique. This is in order to reduce uh, the risk of conduction subnormality. But this is actually also a perfect view to have patient-specific commercial alignment. So if you look at, at this view at, um, at the aortic valve, you can see that you have the commissures between the right and the left uh, cusp pointing towards the right-hand side of your floral screen. So the only thing you need to do is to place one of the leaflet posts on the right-hand side of the screen. And with the Navitar valve, it's quite easy to see those leaflet posts. It can be seen here in the mid of the stent frame. So in this right-left coronary cusp or lab view, the only thing you have to do is to rotate your system until you have one of these leaflet posts pointing towards the right-hand side of the screen. And if you see that, you just deploy the valve, and afterwards you can see here confirm that the leaflet posts are positioned on the right-hand side of the screen, meaning that you have patient-specific commercial alignment and thereby easier access to the coroners in the future. Thank you very much, Lars. Um, this is a, a, a very important point to, to really guarantee that uh, the coronary arteries uh, can be freely um, assessed, uh, assessed um, later on. Do you think um, that there is an um, influence on the hemodynamic as well if you use this commissural alignment garnish? I, I suspect that is because um, in diastole is when your coronaries get filled. And I think if your anatomy is aligned to improve coronary filling and diastole, I think that would be a benefit for patients, especially those patients with uh, you know, poor left leg function or already have some degree of coronary artery disease. Any improvement of flow during diastole uh, will be important, both for short-term and I suspect long-term as well, and certainly for the younger uh, patients, for sure. Dave, what is your experience with the coronary um, re-access? Um, so perhaps we can discuss both issues. So um, one um, would be the commissural alignment, which works perfect. But um, of course, we do have patients in which we do not have um, had the perfect look on this one. How is your experience with a Navitor device um, when you try to reassess um, the coronary arteries? Yeah, I, I think with the whole Navitor and Portico Classic series of valves, because of the large cell design and the intraannular location of the leaflets, we've certainly had no issues in reaccessing coronary arteries following uh, Navitor or Portico Classic deployments. So certainly the design of the valve itself also leads to a facilitation of coronary reaccess following the initial TAVI procedure. 
Lars, uh, do you have any experience which catheter do you, uh, to use um, for coronary access? Of course, the anatomy is a little bit different from, from um, an anatomy where no valve is um, inserted. Um, any tips and tricks? Again, I would say if you go for commissure alignment, you can see you can use standard catheters. It's very easy to, to just get outside the, the cusp and then uh, access the coronary arteries. If you have a patient with, with commissure misalignment, you have to try different catheters and, and you can find reports how to, to do it, but it's going to be much more difficult. And as you saw from the, this re-access trial for some of the patient, it's going to be even impossible. And of course, this is an unacceptable situation if you're treating a, a patient with longer life expectancy who may later on be admitted with acute coronary syndrome. You need to be able to access these coronaries. Okay, thank you very much. So we discussed these very important topics of uh, hemodynamics, of PBL and coronary access. And of course, there are other important questions that we would like to address in our live discussion, uh, discussion, which follows immediately. Thank you. Thank you. And here we are for the live discussion. Um, welcome back. And uh, we only have a couple of minutes left, and therefore I would um, really like to concentrate on the daily clinical practice and would like to ask um, Dave, to ask Lars, to ask Garnish, Uh, which role plays Navitor um, in your daily clinical practice? Are there any special features that have to be um, addressed? First, we start with Ganesh, who is immediately to my right side. Ganesh, which role plays Navitor in your daily uh, clinical practice? Uh, thanks, Helga. I think, uh, to be brief, this technology, I think, um, allows us to access many of its unique uh, features. So access, it's got a low profile for sheetless. I really think the hydrophilic feature is amazing. Uh, it really does go where you want it to go. And then finally, we've talk, touched topics about deliverability, resheetability, positioning, cornea access. So I do think this technology where it is now uh, has the ability to become a workhorse uh, technology in your cath lab. Last workhorse for you as well. It's been for many years in this valve, and I think it works in most anatomy. Of course, today it's only going up to an aortic annular size of 27. But saying that um, the Navitor valve uh, will come in a third version, the Titan valve, which is going up to 30 millimeter annular size. And this, this study will start uh, very soon. So I think it's going to close that gap with the LRS anatomy as well. I think the point you just raised is very important. So, um, especially um, um, in, in Europe, we have a lot of patients with an annular size of a larger uh, than um, the range which was available right now. Therefore, everybody is looking forward to see these larger valves in order to guarantee a safe treatment of those patients as well. Dave, Navitor in daily clinical practice as well. Do you see any patients who are perf perhaps not perfectly suited for Navitor, or do you see it as a um, workhorse for all patients? Yeah, good question, Helga. Like Lars, uh, it's been a workhorse for us for some while. I think the addition of an, uh, the ceiling skirt to reduce PVL has been a huge step forward in addition to the delivery system, the FlexNav system. So yes, I see it continuing in my usage as a workhorse valve. Where wouldn't we use it? I guess the uh, perhaps untried or unpublished evidence is really within bicuspid valves, and that in itself is still a, an area that we're significantly learning about. But certainly in my practice, I think it will remain, if not increase its usage as a workhorse valve. Um, we, we do have the, the new um, delivery catheter and therefore we can treat patients with um, smaller profiles, arteries. Are there any patients you still would like to treat with a um, usual sheath um, or do you use the inline sheath in all patients, Dave? Yeah, good question. I think there are still some people for whom avoiding multiple sheath exchanges, i.e. the avoiding inline 
system is still useful. Perhaps people who are hemodynamically unstable, I think, would still benefit from a, a sheath procedure. And also some people who are perhaps more obese and you're more concerned about their vascular access site might also benefit from a sheath procedure as well. But for the majority of people, I use the inline system. And certainly, as we've seen from the trial data, we have a very low rate of vascular complications uh, with using that system. But again, suiting the procedure or uh, making the procedure individualized to the needs of each individual patient, I think, is key. So perfect. Um, with that, we are slowly coming to an end, and I would like to thank uh, the three speakers. I would like to thank um, David, would like to thank Lars and Garnish for sharing the insights into this really um, good new technology uh, which comes around. We learned um, that with a Navitor device, we can further reduce PVL. Uh, we have a very good delivery system um, which does not make a large bore sheath necessary. Um, therefore, I think we are on a good way to treat even more patients, even younger with the aortic stenosis. Thank you very much and have fun for the next days at EuroPCR. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye-bye.